It's neighborhood Nip Hustle. I'm locked in with my homie Nick on Hard Knock TV. Last time that I don't come through fly. Check. No cosign. I ain't need radio to do mine. I done fine. And I take my time. Check. And take my tribe. Every level that I crossed in this game. Like state lines. It was visionary. Either I'm genius or you niggas scary. Maybe it's both in this balance. I deliver daily. For every nigga in these streets trying to feed the babies. The single mama's working hard not to miss a payment. All right, let's get it. Get right into it. Let's get uh, it. I always like to start it with um, if there was a movie about your life, and the opening scene is kind of going through Crenshaw, coming through the front door of your house. Mm-hmm. What are we seeing? What are we hearing? What are we smelling? We seeing um, a family house, you know, like pictures on the um, mantle, you know what I mean? Um, a bed in the living room, a, a, a couch with a rollout bed underneath it. You smelling coffee. Or like cooking, my granny was always cooking. My mom was always cooking. We used to live together. You see in a family house, you know what I mean? And you smell it food. My grandma and my mom was was chefs. They cooked a lot. What are we hearing? What's playing? Man, uh, you might be hearing the price is right. Granny had that on lock. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Or uh the radio. My mom would play the radio a lot when she cleaned up, you know what I'm saying? So like a jazz station or like a, a R&B, classic R&B station, you know what I mean? You know? Do you remember what your first like musical memories were? It always was around music. I grew up in like the 90s really, was born in 85, so it was death row in LA. You know, like outside you didn't even have to have the CDs, you didn't have to buy it, you just went outside, you could hear it. Mm-hmm. I was five in 1990, you know what I'm saying? So that was what I heard. I was surrounded by rap music. And then I grew up around, you know, my mom and then my sister's father was uh, like a big record collector too, and like Motown stuff. Do you remember at what point you're like, this is what I want to do? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I think like, um, really like the Chronic album when Snoop and Dre had that video and Snoop was in the, um, in the parking lot with Dre yeah. and there was this and Easy. God bless Easy and rest in peace. I didn't even know I was a diss back then, but I forgot the name of the song. But yeah, that record, you know, I'm like, this is tight, you know what I'm saying? And they sound real familiar to me, you know what I'm saying? So that made me like, this the biggest rap out right now. And these niggas sound like, and the video look like outside. It was like, yeah, I could do that. This didn't happen overnight. You've been putting in a lot of work. Uh, yeah. Was there any point in your career where you thought about giving up? Well, yeah, I, I think I'd done that before I got recognized. I quit and then get, went back to it and then quit again and then went back to it. I quit rapping and go back to like grinding and try to just focus all about all my energy on just getting money. And then I get to a level of being comfortable and still want to rap and be like, fuck, I'm about to go book a studio or buy some equipment and then fuck with it and then get frustrated for a lot of reasons, whatever the, the learning curve of fucking with music was, whether it was like not having engineers, not having proper equipment, just going through that shit, get frustrated, say fuck this shit, go back to grinding. And I, but I always came back to it too. I was just like, I must really love this shit. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm gonna stop quitting. I'm just gonna say, whatever I go through, I'm gonna fuck with the music regardless. You know what I'm saying? What, what was that thing that kept you coming back? Was it just the, the hunger to, to want to be heard or what? I don't know, I was like attracted to it. You know what I'm saying? I was just always, I ain't feel as fulfilled, you know what I'm saying, doing anything else as I did when I was making music. And then I was really inspired by music when I listened to other music. And I always was like, you know, I would have said this, you know what I mean? Or I would have done this record like this. This was a tight beat, but so I wanted to like try my hand at it, you know what I'm saying? And then when I did it and I, I heard myself making progress, like getting better. I was like, damn, you know, this I could I could do this for 20 years and still have 20 years of improvement to to make. This is something you can't master. Nobody ever has mastered music. You know what I'm saying? And you can really dive deep into it and just uncover new shit, but not reach a ceiling. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so that was like interesting to me. Your victory lap is mm-hmm. it's coming out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, man, it's it's a um it's like a collection of life stories for real. <clears throat> that's the that's the that's like the the focus is the narrative of the whole project. That's really the focus is just the story that's being told. It's not it's not like a um, beginning to end type of story. It's just a theme, you know what I mean? And represented in different real life scenarios that I put on, on song modes. 
But um, yeah, it's like a collection of my life stories and things that happen that make us being here really like special, you know, and just the the uphill battle mm -hmm. and just the details about what that was, you know. What are some of the the ones that kind of impacted the, the album the most? Can you share those with Man, us? Man, just like my brother burying two hundred thousand in the backyard, you know, and just being disciplined enough to have that cast and just say I'm gonna bury him, start from zero again, and start from zero grinding up and then going back to dig it up and then hunting and some change of that 200 was mill dude and then us being in the living room with my mom with the blow dryer and everybody blow drying money and my brother having a breakdown not literally but like like you know what i'm saying like man what is you know what the fuck and going through that and seeing like damn niggas took a hundred some thousand dollar loss off mill dude and like had it on the kitchen table and the living room table throughout the whole house, thinking up the house with the blow dryer trying to, you know, salvage the money. And like to put that into one of the songs, you know what I'm saying? And revisit that from this point right here. Right. And just like other things too, I don't want to go overboard and get too many of the, the details, but just like real stories that took place and, and things that we, we reflect on internally and just be like, man, you know, Moments we thought it was a rap, like this is it, we it's over. You know what I'm saying? We fucked up. We made a critical mistake, and you know, bouncing back and getting through it, and coming into other challenges, and then, you know, from a point of like your first album is about to drop, you in a successful position business wise, and then to think about put yourself back in them emotions and fell out again. You know what I'm saying? Knowing now, now we know everything gonna be all right. You know, we didn't right then, but now thinking about it, it's like 2020, so to write about it was therapeutic and like, I thought that was important to, rep to be represented on my first album. I know one of the tracks that stood out uh, <clears throat> yesterday was Blue Laces 2. Yeah. One of the, the third verse. Yeah. You, you stopped it and you want to make sure everybody yeah, yeah, yeah. Put, put a close ear to what yeah, you were saying. Yeah, exactly. Uh, can, can you lend us into to why that verse is important to you? Yeah, I just, again, it's another real story that happened. And I and you know, sometimes like being a luxury car, or like a, a penthouse, or like a you know first class flight, or you know in a bomb ass hotel somewhere, and just remember, like man, you know the the complete opposite, you know being on the run from the police or like driving your homie to the hospital, bleeding, just thinking about, you know. The struggle, really, and just the the, the journey, and what every, what we went through, in the in the process of trying to get here, and uh, represent that in the music, you know. Blue Aces One is one of my favorite records, one of my fans' most cherished records, I think, that I've put out. So I wanted to like revisit the record for the album, and uh, it just happened naturally. I didn't intend on speaking on that specific story. That's just what I heard when I heard the beat. Uh, Bron premiered the, the Blue Laces 2 track on yeah. socials. Uh, IT also shows you a lot of love. Yeah. Do you feel that your music uh, inspires athletes to train because of there is that, that hustler, the go get it, the, the grind mode? Do you do you feel like a lot of athletes come to you and, and talk to you about like feeling inspired by the music to you know give them that extra fuel? I've noticed that, that specifically athletes react to, to the message. And then also I think like, you know, they come from the same environment. They going through the same struggle. They just, you know, attacking it through their gifts on the, on the court or on the field. And we doing it through the art and through the music. So I think that whether it's the message of motivation or just if they apply it to sports or if they apply it to just the pursuit of like becoming better and like, you know, bossing up and being, you know, successful and you like maximizing your potential, you know what I'm saying, and like challenging yourself. I think those themes is in the music and in the message, like the marathon. But I, I have noticed that, like, yeah, athletes specifically, mm -hmm. you know, reacting or inspire. And likewise, we, we, we sit in the studio and had a, had a playoffs on mute and go, go back and watch classic performances, you know what I'm saying, and just be like, look at the zone they was in, you know what I'm saying? So definitely, I think we both feed off each other. It's crazy that a player like IT, who to me has got like, he's all heart, you know, For he's sure. one of the shortest guys For in the sure. NBA, but he's For all sure. heart. It's crazy that he he would be the one relating to the, the underdog, you know. Man, struggle. I've been knowing IT since he was in college, man. You know, when I used to go to Seattle, he used to come to the shows in Tacoma. 
with Nate Robinson. Mm -hmm. And that was early supporters, you know, from like the first marathon mixtape. So to see him make his moves in the NBA and, you know what I mean, go get niggas hell last season and just run up his value, mm -hmm. you know, I look at his career like, like I look at mine and his trajectory, like, you know, he proved himself. And you know what I mean? He he wasn't picked. You know what I'm saying? He 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 made himself valuable, you know what I'm saying, against a lot of odds. And so I, I fuck with IT heavy. What about uh with Braun, I see you both really doing a lot in the community and doing a lot for, you know, black businesses. Do you guys ever talk about that at all? You just kinda like watch what each one's doing or Nah, we don't talk about it and or we haven't. But I think that um LeBron, you know, he uh he know his position and he and he embraces his role from what I see. Mm -hmm. And I try to do the same. You know what I mean? You in a leadership position, you gotta embrace it. You in a position to have resources, you gotta allocate toward what you believe in and, and you know, so I think that we both relate in that respect. You know, but um we ain't never had no specific convos about it. You know what I'm saying? More so just like, you know, salute, you killing them, you know what I mean? Keep going hard and Repping right, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Somebody who's also giving you props for for black business and just putting down has been K Dot. Yeah. He was on Twitter and you know he gave you you know a yeah. salute for that. Yeah. But definitely I seen that tweet and you know, again man I've been knowing Dot since um the LAX tour with uh with Game, you know what I'm saying? And um that's another uh person that um made they so valuable. You know what I'm saying? And put in work and, you know what I mean, built up what we looking at now. And uh, It's funny, the first interview that we had with you in 2005, I don't know if you remember because it was a different host back then. It was Davey D. He walked past the he back. He walked past in the back. Him and J-Rock. Yeah, yeah my homeboy Prosper, yeah. yeah. And Top Dog walked past in the back. Yeah. And Robin Hood. Robin Hood out front <laughs> right now. Everybody was, yeah. it was crazy. Yeah, I remember Did that. Did you know them back then? Or yeah, for sure. Kind of for sure. Time? We was all up and coming in L.A. and just was like running into each other when... We'd be in the building. I remember they had a situation at Warner Brothers and we was trying to play music at Warner and so we'd bump into each other in the halls and doing promo on the East Coast, me and J-Rock, you know what I mean? We'd always campaign together, doing songs together and all that and just watching Top Bill, TDE and watching Schoolboy and Kendrick and Av and everybody just go up. It was all, you know, early seeds was planted for that. Even Ali, like Ali mixed the album, you know what I mean? And, yeah, he oh, makes Victory Lap, and he oh. makes the uh, No Pressure Project me and Bino just put out. So um, it was a long road, a long process, and uh, you know, we've been uh, we've been thugging for a minute with each other. There's a song called Dedication on your project. Yeah, uh, that's one of the standouts for me. What can you tell me about that song? Man, just I think it's a it's a it's it's really a clear expression of what I was trying to say on the album and just as an artist and just what I went through and what I experienced and just like, you know, it took dedication, that's the best word. You know what I mean? And I think that's the best piece of advice I can give anybody is to be dedicated. Yeah, that record came out, happened naturally the way it got wrote. It's just speaking to the process and you know what I mean? It's a passionate record, you know? And it got a dope, dope feature. And uh, I think like you said, that'll be one of the standouts for sure. Mm -hmm. 